thank you so much for your presence in our lives, that you, Father, are with us, that you are leading us, you are guiding us, and you are our rear guard. And so as much as we're in this place, we trust that you're giving us ears to hear what your spirit is saying and that you would give us a heart to receive. And so we humble ourselves before your righteous right hand even now that we are receptive for your glory. I commit myself unto you and I thank you for using me as your mouthpiece. May your word be in my mouth. Cover me with the shadow of your hand as your word goes out line upon line, precept upon precept, a little here and a little there for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. I thank you, Father, that grace, grace is upon each of us now to hear and to receive in Jesus' name. And all the believers said, Amen. Amen. Well, we continue in our series, Who is Jesus? We're continuing in this series because I really do believe that it's so very easy to live our lives with a broad stroke of who Jesus is without the details that enable us to respond rightly to him. I know this because when I gave my life to Christ, I was only as strong as the knowledge that I had. Consequently, the more I knew about him, the stronger I became in him. And so I want us to see the scripture so that you're encouraged to be strong in who your Savior is. There in Proverbs chapter 24, we're looking at verse 5, the New Living Translation. It says, those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. That's why I'm so thankful for grace, because despite my ignorance, he loved, he loved me enough to reveal himself to me, even me, that I would know, that I would know that he is love, that I would know that he lives, and that I would know that he is the giver of life. And the same is true for each one of you. This is your year of grace, your year of undeserved, unearned, and unmerited favor. Favor, that is, it means God's overgenerous, preferential treatment that he is giving to you just so that you will know, that you will know him. And so we found out that Jesus is the Savior, that he is the Son of the living God, and that he is the Son of God. We also talked the next week as we started this series about how Jesus is the light of the world, that he is the Lamb of God, that he is the living water. And then last week we found out that he is our all and all, meaning he is the one who completes us, and he is the one who gives meaning to us. And so today, our message is entitled, Follow the Leader. Somebody say, follow the leader. The message is entitled, Follow the Leader, because our goal is to understand who we are in relation to who he is. And so I think we're all pretty familiar as the, with the childhood game, Follow the Leader. That's when someone does gestures and they are playing or jumping up and down doing some kind of antic, and then everyone behind them is supposed to do exactly what they see the leader do. You all remember the game? You do exactly what, they, what they're doing, and they try to trick you up so that you can get out, because if you miss doing what they're doing, what? You're out. But if you can stay in there and keep on doing what they're doing, whatever it is that they're doing, if you can be the last one standing, then you're the winner because you followed the leader and now you get to lead. Maybe some of you all can remember a couple years ago where there was a big campaign, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Everyone was seeing it. It was on billboards. It was on uh, banners and wristbands. And it was everywhere because everyone wanted to say, what would Jesus do in the situation that you're in? The implication was basically that we should imitate Jesus. And that brings us to our first point. Fill out your note sheet that Jesus is the image of God. Jesus is the image of God. Colossians 1 verse 15 says that he is the image 
of the invisible God. Then in Hebrews chapter 1, I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. It says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. Look at this, verse 3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." I want us to focus on this part in verse 3 that says that he is the express image of his person. The New Living Translation says he expresses the very character of God. From this scripture, we see that Jesus, according to the message translation, he perfectly mirrors God. He perfectly mirrors God. And Jesus himself said throughout the Gospel of John, there in chapter 14, verse 11, I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. He tells us in chapter 14 of the Gospel of John, I am in my Father. But he also says in chapter 5, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. He tells us in John chapter 10 verse 30, I and my Father are one. (laughs) Sounds like follow the leader to me. But let's look at scripture so we can understand just a little bit more. Jesus images God based upon God's original plan for humanity. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. God's plan there in verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And so Jesus, he comes into the world according to Philippians, saying he comes into the world in the form of God, and he doesn't consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. He became what? Obedient Obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In other words, God planned for humanity to be one with him, to live in obedience and thereby mirror or image him in the earth. That was the plan. But humanity walked in disobedience, and when they did, they bore the image of sin instead of bearing the image of God. And Jesus, who is the Son of God, he emptied himself of his privilege so that we're not just saved by grace, but he emptied himself of privilege so that we also could be image bearers in the earth like him. So then he tells us in John chapter 14, I and my father, I am in my father and you in me and I in you. He tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that you've been made alive together with Christ, for by grace you have been saved, that you've been raised up together and made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. We read about and hear all the time, Colossians, Christ in, in, in us, the hope of glory. But here's another scripture, Romans chapter 8. We can read, you are conformed into the image of his dear son. And so when you belong to God, 
That's why we can read scriptures like Jesus says in John, John 15, saying, apart from me, you can do nothing because you're no longer in union. You're outside. But in union, when I'm mirroring, mirroring him, then I can do all things. That's why Paul can look at us and say, be imitators of God. And when you do, it means you're following the leader. And when you don't, it means you're out. <laughs> it's a tall order. But we can, we can image him because Jesus is, fill in your note sheet number two, he is the forerunner. He is the forerunner. A forerunner is a person who goes ahead of another. It's the same as a pioneer. A pioneer is the person who is among the first to explore something, to settle in a new area or a new country. Well, Jesus has gone ahead of us as the forerunner. He's gone ahead showing us how to image God in the earth, how we live our lives day after day imaging him. He's gone ahead as our pioneer, leading us towards the way of God, leading us towards not just God himself and heaven one day, but blazing the trail, showing us of what it looks like to be sanctified, that is set apart. What does it look like to live in holiness? He's our example of how to image God in the earth, Monday through Friday, through hard situations and easy ones. He's the one that sets himself up as the example. Here's how Hebrews chapter 2 says it. It says in verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Again, he is our example of what a restored image looks like, acts like, is like. That's why we say in him, I live and move and have my being. And so to understand this a little better, I want to reflect upon the story of Israel. They were given a promise, the promised land, but they had to go through the wilderness in order to get to this promised land. Metaphorically, this wilderness would represent discouragement. It would represent weight and challenge, frustration and anger and fear and struggle and opposition. Those are the kinds of experiences, the feelings that they endured as they traveled through the wilderness. And they're the same for us today. That throughout the wilderness, it's a perfect opportunity to come out of union. A perfect opportunity to stop imaging him, to stop mirroring the Father. Why? Because it's too hard. I don't want to do that. I don't want to live holy. I don't want to give up that. I don't understand why this is happening. It's a perfect opportunity to come out of the mirroring image of our Father. Stop imaging God when, in fact, Jesus has set the example. Israel stopped. They stopped imaging God. They experienced the hardship in the wilderness, and they started to grumble and complain. They started to do everything that was contrary. They went right back to the Genesis where they disobeyed God, walking in complete rebellion. And the Bible tells us that they did not enter in. And so fast forward back to Hebrews. Hebrews 3.12, the, the author tells us, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, in departing from this union, in departing from obedience, in departing from imaging him in the earth. In other words, don't follow Israel because we have a better example in Jesus. We have a better example. He demonstrates for us how to manage the wilderness. Not just 
saying what is written when we're in the wilderness, but in how he continued to image God through it all, through the storms of life, through it all. He demonstrates how to overcome. And then he writes to us in the New Testament, it says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So let's go back now to the Philippians passage, because we read Philippians 2, verse 6. But now I want us to look at Philippians 2, verse 5. It says there in verse 5, let this mind be in you, imaging, following the leader. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So we are to follow Jesus' example of how to image God. And so it brings us right back to obedience, which brings us to our third point, that Jesus is the great high priest. He is the great high priest. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You see, as we image Christ throughout life, God already knows that we're not going to do it 100% perfection. He already knows that there will be some failings, that we will miss it, that there will be times when we image him well and there will be times when somehow our image is shifted. And there will be times when we do so on purpose and there will be times when we have shifted the image and we don't even realize it. He already knows, but he wants us to be encouraged. He wants us to be encouraged that we're never alone. That even in those moments, he will never cast us aside. That he will not forget us. That he will not stop loving us. That he will not discard us. Here's how Hebrews 2 says it. It says there, because of his concern for the children of Abraham, we would be the children of Abraham. Because of his concern for the children of Abraham, Christ had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God and to make atonement, that is, amends for sin. And so when we miss it, God has provided the remedy, Jesus. But because of Jesus, because of Jesus, who became like the Son of Man, or who was the Son of Man, because of Jesus, who is very much God, the Son of God, because of this hope that's set before us, we have access to the Father. Because of his sacrifice, because of his love, because of his example, we have access to the sovereign, and that's grace. Grace, grace upon each of our lives. I want to break this down just a little bit more. So I want you to bear with me. If you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament talks about how God's presence was behind this veil that was referenced in Hebrews. But the people were kept outside of the veil. They couldn't go behind the veil where God's presence was. They needed a priest. And so human beings, these priests, they were found in the lineage of the Levitical priesthood. And so let's look at Hebrews chapter 9 so we can see it. But into the second part of the tabernacle, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. 
The second part of this tabernacle kept the people out by use of this veil. And so only the priests could go into the presence of God, if you will. But Jesus, Jesus who imaged God perfectly, served as a forerunner, and he came from another priesthood, not the priesthood of a man, basic man. He comes from a priesthood that does not give us a history, a history before or a history behind. He comes from the order of Melchizedek. And that's important because when he died on the cross, something significant happens. The Bible tells us there in Matthew chapter 27, we're looking at verse 50, that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Verse 51, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The tearing of this veil in the temple meant that no longer was God inaccessible. No longer would there be limitation for regular folk. No longer would the children be on the outside while a certain priesthood of a lineage be able to go in the presence of God. No longer would that be so because the veil is now ripped in two. Here's the difference that must be noted. Jesus didn't go into this earthly tabernacle. When he died on the cross, he offered up a sacrifice, not of an animal. Jesus goes into heaven himself and goes into the actual presence of God and he offers up himself. Here's how Hebrews chapter 4 says it. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. So if you've been tempted with doubt, he was tempted with doubt. If you were tempted with fear, he's been tempted with fear. If you've been tempted with lust, he was tempted with lust. If you were tempted with disobedience, he was tempted with disobedience. Apathy, any other thing that we are tempted with, Jesus also was tempted. Yet he was without sin. He did not shift in his image. He continued to be an image bearer. Verse 16, therefore, as a result of what Jesus did and who Jesus is, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So hear me today, church. You may have blown it. You may have failed yourself and failed everyone around you, but you do have an advocate with the Father. His name is Jesus, and he is the great high priest. So you don't need a man, and there is no veil that keeps you on the outside. You can come boldly to the throne of God in the name of Jesus and obtain mercy and find grace to help you in your time of need, help you to live, help you to stand, help you through the wilderness of life, help you whether you're an image bearer or you're shifted off. He is the one who's come to help you. So because of grace, he is the Savior of the world. He is the son of God and the son of man because of grace. He's the light of the world. He's the living water and the lamb of God because of grace. He is your forerunner and he is your great high priest ever making intercession for each one of you to keep you, to hold you, to upstate, to sustain you, to lead you and guide you, to be your rear guard. So a thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh your dwelling place. That's the grace that he has afforded to each and every one who will call upon his noble name because it's only in the name of Jesus that we have free access to the Father. Only through the name of Jesus. He is the leader, and we are supposed to follow. Come on, shout, follow the leader. leader. Look at somebody and say, follow the leader. Come on, look at somebody else and say, follow the leader. You've got the grace to follow 
the leader. Every head bow, every eye closed. We thank you so much, Father, for your word. It is spirit and it is life. I pray that as much as it has gone into the ears of your people, that the word would come alive within each person, that they would know who they are in Christ, that they would not live a life of condemnation and death, destruction and fear, but Lord, that they would live a life where they overcome in Christ Jesus where they are more than conquerors, where they really do know that they can do all things through Christ who gives them strength. I thank you, Father, for the strong, that you would encourage their heart. And I thank you, Lord, for even the weak, that you would show us, Lord, how to align our lives so that we truly are followers of you. As we start off this new year, it is our desire to please you. And so we're humbled before your righteous right hand, trusting that you've given us ears to hear what your spirit is saying, trusting that your spirit is pinpointing exactly in our ways, in our lives, in our hearts, those things that don't please you where we've shifted in our image bearing. I cry out to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would speak to every heart so that when we leave this place, we are closer aligned with you, mirroring, mirroring your son, Jesus Christ in the earth. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.